we want to welcome on board Nitya. Yes, you did. <laughs> you need my validation. Oh, thank you. Um, so thank you guys for having me. I'm not a morning person, but I will do my best. Uh, we're going to look into the past to try and understand and find solutions for the future. So I think you guys might have seen this um, kind of GIF or meme going around uh, on social media where it says like 10 generations ago, which is about 250 years ago, you would have 4,000 great-grandparents. Go back another 250 years. Did they have chilies? Did they have potatoes? Because those things only came over in the 1500s with the Columbia Exchange, right? From South America to Europe to Asia. So when we think about how we eat and how we plan to eat for future generations, so much of the way we approach food is linear. We're all webs, right? We're part of this huge food ecosystem. We have generational ancestral ties beyond Singapore and Malaysia. And the way we look at food right now in urban ecosystems is linear. You know, we go to the supermarket, we go to the grocers, we go to the street hawker, and the food kind of, the way we think about it, ends there. We don't think about the farmers that are growing it. We don't think about the social, economic, political pathways that affect it. So on the way over here today in the Grab, I was trying to explain Kita Food Festival to my Grab driver. You know, he's like, fine dining, what's that? You know, and I was like, oh, it's a, it's a 10 course. Uh, usually, you know, the chef dictates the menu. It's exploring the concept of food. But he kind of brought it back to the issues that were the most, I would say, the most kind of basic, right? The intricate, the fundamental foundational aspects of being human, humans who have to eat to survive. And he talked about rice and how rice, even though it's been cultivated in Asia for close to 10,000 years, at the moment, for Singapore especially, most of our rice is imported. Right? In Malaysia, I think the imported uh, rice price has gone up dramatically in the last year. And even though local rice production, which makes up about 70% of all rice, is controlled, there's still a monopoly around it. And somehow, and quite obviously, I guess, he also tied the rising food prices with something that he felt immediately affected by, which was the political situation. Um, so he felt politics affected rice production, affected what he was eating on a day-to-day -day basis and how he was feeding his family. So we can't talk about food without talking about history and about culture, right? In multicultural communities like Singapore and Malaysia, we are aware of the restrictions that different communities have. Hindus don't eat beef, Malays don't eat pork, no alcohol but also how it's used in ritual for prayer, when someone is born, when you celebrate a birth, before the baby is born, right? And post, the postpartum, your jamu, your wraps, your confinement meals, and then when you die, also what do people eat? What are given as offerings? That's something we experience very intimately in our day-to-day -day lives. But also let's talk about beyond that. What here was saying about maritime histories, about how things are brought by colonialism, by trade, by religion across the world, right? But something I also wanted to talk about is war, which we are now hearing a lot about, right? With what's going on in Palestine, with what's going on in Ukraine. It's Ukraine and Russia's fight, which is happening all the way up there, affects our food prices across the world. Prices of oil, prices of rice, prices of wheat. And then what's happening in Palestine, an ancient bed of culture of so much that we know olive trees. Um, so that also gets destroyed or changed or evolves in the pathway of history. So we are not lines, we are webs. And if we start to look at every single thing that we eat, 
each grain of rice as something that's larger than us, that's something that affects multiple people along the way, and not just in the production, not just in the recipes, not just in what it means to us and how it resonates within us, but also what happens after, right? Right, right now with climate change, it's also a major issue that affects food production, especially raw materials. And the kind of solution which is being prepared at the moment is to eat local. Local is the new global, right? But how do you eat local without being restricted? Being just, do you have to eat, like imagine a herb like Ulam Raja. Do you have to use it only the way your grandparents used it? Could you mix it and match it with all the influences that you have? But also in farming methods. So I was at my friend's uh, Synthropic farm in Kota Tinggi a couple of days ago, and they are trying to create a fruit forest, right? Biodynamic, synthropic, organic, all the words, and regeneratively farmed. But is permaculture something that's new to us in the tropics? It's not, right? Ancient civilizations across the tropics were doing polyculture farming. Monoculture is something that was introduced after World War II. So with the World Bank and Monsanto and Bayer and all these big companies, monoculture was also introduced. A format that barely worked in temperate zones was pushed into the tropics where it doesn't really work. But we push for it, we try to grow one variety of banana. We try to grow one variety of palm, which doesn't work, right? It's not healthy, it's not resilient, and that's what we're learning. So I thought I should share a little bit about the difference between Malaysia and Singapore. I mean, we're same, same, we have shared history, but we also have a bit of difference, which affects our relationship that we have with indigenous plants and indigenous plant knowledge. 60% of Malaysia's food is imported, has gone up steadily over the last 10 years. 90% of Singapore's food is imported. Less than 1% of our land is agriculture. Almost 27% of Malaysia's land is agriculture. But what is being grown on that 27% has also changed dramatically over the last 10 years. As we shift towards cash crops, uh, monocultures, as you would have seen with the palm deserts that are all over the place which are being now converted to regenerative food forests, thankfully. But it's also the knowledge, and the cultural demographics, the racial demographics, that influence the relationship, right? So Singapore has a larger Chinese migrant population. And so bok choys and kailans are more popular in our day-to-day -day diet. So the plants that are indigenous or native or naturalized to the tropics are not necessarily as resonant in Chinese culture. So Singapore, if you go to a supermarket where most people do their shopping, as Darren says, you know, we forage there after work, the stuff that you find there, there's very little plants that are indigenous. If you want to get laksa leaf or uh, torch ginger, you will be hard pressed to find that in a supermarket. So unless you're going to the wet markets, which you can't do if you have an office job because they all close by 2 to 5 p.m., you are not cooking any of these plants. You don't have access to any of these plants. So you have a very kind of Singapore, what you have is like a kind of a very aspirational food culture, which we also see in mega cities. It's impossible to just focus on how we used to eat, right? Like back then, your great grandparents, they were eating what was grown within maximum 20 kilometers, right? Now, if we say we want to eat local in Singapore, we say, look at a 100-mile radius because we don't grow anything. But aspirations are to look outwards, to look to our most recent past. So we have a very kind of Eurocentric lens on the food we think is of value. And that kind of trickles down the chain in terms of what you can find in your supermarkets, trickles down even further to what is grown to cater, so Singapore is basically the, right now we are startup, uh, high-tech farming, hydroponics, aquaculture, you name it, we put money behind it. Soil-based farming, not so much. Whereas in Malaysia, I see that it's still something that's thriving, something that's being pushed for, and something that's still very much 
possible. And when we talk about Malaysia, we also have to talk about Sabah and Sarawak, and they are very kind of still a close relationship with nature. So I wanted to talk about some of the work that uh, I do. Um, anthropology is really nice uh, in academia, of course, but it's also a lived experience. All of us are couch anthropologists. You know, when you sit and you talk about a dish, chicken rice in Malaysia is not as good as the chicken rice in Singapore, but you get better satay in Malaysia, for example. That's anthropology, right? And I did uh, Ethiopian brunch bandits here at the B uh, about 10 years ago now. And I, was, I think it was really what we were trying to show is can we shift our lens from Eurocentric to equatorial south? When we look for inspiration, which is sustainable, which builds community, which has food sovereignty, which resonates with us, which we can identify with, where we can use plants that still form the fabric of our environment. We look to the equator because they have very similar stuff. Like Ivan does uh, a mokweka at, uh, at uh, Nori, you know, and it's so similar to a laksa, for example. Or if you want to make a Caribbean hot sauce, you know, you use sawtooth coriander, which they call uh, Chardon Beni in Trinidad, for example. And it's an integral part of their cuisine, but here it's still very much a weed. So if we look along horizontally instead of vertically, we have so much that we can do with our indigenous plants. And that's kind of what we did with Branch Bandits. So this is my web. Um, I did a show about foraging. I'll play a little clip. Does it play? Anyway, it's called Edible Wild, and we went all over Asia Pacific foraging in urban environments. I'm on a journey across um, eight different cities and cultures to discover what amazing ingredients can be found in and around our modern cities. He literally just pushes himself out. It's not always easy. There are also leeches and some little poisonous snakes. <laughs> I can't wait to put this in a dish together. But the rewards are breathtaking. Wow, what an incredible view. I'll be getting help from experts. <laughs> oh my God, it's like coming. Okay, so that's uh, you know, for TV, right? Uh, you, you taste a plant the first time, you've climbed a hill in Seoul, trying to taste it, and then you have to sound excited for five takes. Um, but we discovered so much, the potential of urban cities. You know, you can forage in urban cities, mega cities, and you can still cook food from, like we make kimchi in Seoul from just foraged ingredients, for example. So I also organize farmers markets where we try to showcase local produce. And this was a really, I think a very big, um, kind of very something very close to my heart. We worked with Yale and US to put together a series, a panel series on Singapore's 30 by 30 vision. So Singapore plans to co uh, grow 30% of its own produce by 2030. So we had bureaucrats, we had academics, we had startup founders, but we also had soil-based permaculture farmers. And the discussions and what the hope for it was, we had someone that was on the Asian rice project, talking about rice in Vietnam. Uh, where they're trying to, it's a very complicated story, you should go and find out more about it. Politics, economics, big business, all with their hands in Asia, in Vietnam, trying to grow different types of rice. There you go. So right now my focus is on seeds, right? Third generation, open pollinated, heirloom seeds. Singapore is never, well never, going to be an agricultural, an agrarian society, right? We're too urban, we, our nation building is too far along. But what we can do because of being a, like a port, being at the center of trade, um, and also of our ec economic stability, is to be an archiver of heirloom seeds from across the tropics. So what I do with seed exchange is to make these things available to the community by the community. So we have a platform, we work with students, we get community farmers to share their seeds. We've got seeds from Jamaica, from Tanzania, from different farmers to try and grow. We're trying to grow baobab seed in Dempsey. We'll see how that goes in about 100 years, if we're still around. Oh. 
Okay, so now we get to future food. This is your future food system, right? By 2050, we are predicted to have 9 billion people. 9 billion hungry people who will increasingly reach what we call the middle class with aspirational food tastes, right? Two thirds of them are going to live in cities. And 90% of those cities are going to be in Africa and Asia. So how do we change our food system from being linear, how we approach it from being linear to being a web? Something with, where you get ingredients from many different places, where you eat in many different places, you ask questions from the people who are making your food and growing your food, how it's done. So as you guys already are very aware, cities are hotbeds of inequality, right? Like some of, we are very privileged to be here talking about food, having access to eat whatever we want. Thinking about food is a luxury. Thinking about food in terms of in its conceptual way is a luxury. Thinking about food, whether you're gonna have enough, is also a prevalent condition in cities. So how can we make sure that everyone has enough to eat in 2050 in a way that doesn't take more from the environment than it already does, but gives back more? The solution, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a food agricultural organization, but I'll try my best. So the solution is for chefs to approach it from a table to farm basis. So instead of you thinking what the consumer wants, the consumer gets what is grown by your farmer, what is in season, what is of the best quality, and then the chef uses his skills and his branding and his reach to convert those things into something consumers want to experience. Seed autonomy. So Bayer is now one of the biggest seed conglomerates in the world at the moment. Most of the seeds you buy are coming from somewhere else. We don't do seed saving anymore. So countries to have resilient food systems need to start saving seeds, but also diversified, decentralized farming. Food production doesn't just have to come from big farms. It can come from community gardens. It can come from smallholder farmers. It could, even in major cities, come from your neighbors. So creating a network where access and supply chain logistics match up to this vision. So that's where it falls a lot of the time. You want to support a regenerative farmer, they grow amazing pineapple, but they only grow pineapple like with enough quantity to, to kind of export and share. So you're eating pineapples for the whole week if you get it from that farmer. But how do we create an ecosystem where you can get it from five farmers who are growing five different things in one neighborhood so you get a box, right? So those are the kind of systems we want to see in place across the tropics. Let's go. Right. So future foods. You would have heard a lot about startups, excitement, how we're going to solve the food crisis, how we're going to feed and nourish the growing population. Right now, alternative meat is the, is the solution that's being given. But it's expensive. How accessible is alternative meat to everyone? It's not right yet, but it will be. But one of the biggest growing markets is plant-based protein. And these 10 ingredients are some of the top 10 ingredients. Do you guys recognize any of these ingredients? We have seaweed. Indonesia is actually your biggest producer of seaweed. We have spirulina. So algae farms are popping up from the Middle East to Southeast Asia. We have bambara nut, um, which is uh, African. <clears throat> it comes from Africa, but you also find it in Indonesia. And the startup called What If Foods is making noodles from it. You have moringa, uh, which is something also from our region. Duckwheat is right now one of the highest protein plant sources. It's being catered now for animal feed, but soon for humans. Teff from Ethiopia, what you have for making injera. Millet, so I think this year was the year of the millet, according to the FAO. You get a huge variety of millet. Most of it's coming from India at the moment. Jackfruit. Uh, Jackfruit, breadfruit, same family, all across Southeast Asia. 
you would have heard of it being now called pulled pork or alternative meat, but a lot of us grow up with it as nanka, right? Um, this baobab, which I was just uh, talking about, you find it a lot in West Africa. It has one of the highest sources of vitamin C. And it's a huge ass tree, right? So you get a lot of fruit from one tree. And this one, right at the end, is jabaticaba, which is a South American berry, which is also uh, kind of slated to be one of the top 10 future foods. The common factor you would find in all of these plants is that they all come from the tropics. But who owns the land? Who owns the production? And when they become a super sexy startup getting like billions of dollars in funding, who benefits? So these are questions we need to be asking. So in terms of plant genetic diversity, why seeds are important? I'll just end off with the last part, right? So it's not six crops, it's nine crops. So nine crops make up 66% of all plants that are cultivated for consumption. Three crops make up a large chunk of our calories. I mean, I'm sure you know what those uh, three crops are. They're rice, they're corn, they're wheat. But what we're seeing is, especially in places like Africa and Asia, there's in decreasing biodiversity. As more land, as more forest is cleared for farming, and what are people choosing to grow? They're growing foods that everybody wants to eat. If everybody wants to eat avocado toast, where, are all this, where, is, where is it going to be produced? It's going to be in places where there are cheaper land where you can grow. So we're seeing declining biodiversity, we're seeing weaker food systems, we're seeing food systems that are not resilient at all. Like I think you've heard stories in uh, Central America where like a whole crop of bananas just get destroyed because they all get the same virus. And that only happens if you're growing one variety of bananas. If you're doing polyculture, if you're growing multiple varieties of bananas, you will have at least 30 to 50% of your crop that's saved because they are resistant to that particular strain of fungi. So, oh, that's done. Okay, so I guess I'm done. But what I want to say and how I want to add on, end off with is your mental health, your community's health is tied directly to your gut health. And our gut health, even though we think, okay, our lives are so different, even from three generations ago, our guts, they haven't evolved, right? We still have hunter-gatherer guts. And what they want, what your gut wants, is diversity. What your community needs is diversity. What resilient food systems need is diversity. And what you want when you plant anything is diversity. So I will encourage you guys to get as diverse as possible. Eat a random thing every week. Yeah, that's it. That's my message. Oh, thank you very much, Nithya. Yeah, um, thank you for that riveting conversation. Like, I think we've got a few questions, and uh, some of these are quite pertinent also. Um, something that struck me was when you showed the, the, um, um, the fact that all of these grains that are, that are future foods, mm. that are earmarked for future foods, come from not only just tropical areas, but also you'd see that there's a, there's a disparity in, in uh, economy. Mm. And a lot of it come from, well, some people would say third world or developing countries. And well, I mean, let's face it, there is a significant amount of poverty that rights there. And then you said something also about how um, um, these, these choices that are made to utilize the land in these areas are driven by, by our toast and other, you know what I mean? Like, but also other, but, but it's also an economic uh, um, question to it, right? So I think it, what I would really like to ask is, is in the industry and as chefs or as, a, or as restaurants and particularly to smaller restaurants, cafes, uh, mom and pop shops and things like this, like what is our responsibility to push the idea that local ingredients should be more central to our consumption? But I'm just going to guess here, but within the context of, um, within the context of economy, because, you know, it's, 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 I, a few years ago, I said something like, you, it's really difficult to ask someone to think about sustainability or recycling a plastic bag if that's not the first thing on their mind, like feeding themselves is the first thing on their mind. I mean, okay, thank you for the question, Darren. Um, but I think it's, this is a larger question, right? I think there was a show 
from the UK in London, uh, I think it was Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, you know, he was going around saying how everyone should eat free range chicken. And outside like Tesco or something, you know, there was a mom trying to get food for her, feed her four kids. And she was getting as much chicken as possible. Not so much the most sustainable version or the most ethically farmed version. And she was saying my main primary goal here, sustainability is nice, but survival is, is important. I want to feed my kids uh, good food as much as possible. Whatever that good, the best good that I can afford. So I think as chefs, we are, I mean, you guys are at the forefront of what food becomes on trend, right? A lot of the time we think consumers dictate what they want to eat. And it is an economic decision a lot of the times. It's an easy decision to cook food that's familiar to the consumer, right? They are coming there looking for it. I had a friend, you know, he opened up like a brunch cafe in Singapore. And he was saying, you know, I tried to put kangkong in the avocado toast and I got complaints. They were like, why do you not use spinach? Why do you put kangkong? Like, I mean, come on, I'm here for a Sunday brunch. This is not what I want. So there are tiers of where I think chefs can influence. So I think when you are at a fine dining level, when you are a Michelin restaurant, you definitely can set, set and frame food goals, as you would say it, how people eat. But on a very primary basis, in terms of how the third world or the developing world can eat, is how do we make, so if, we, if it becomes trendy for a fine dining restaurant to use local ingredients, then it increases the prices of these ingredients. More people aspire to it. Then do people at the bottom of the economic ladder, can they still afford to eat that? That's what happened to quinoa in Peru, for example. It became so cool that most of the quinoa got exported out and the local indigenous population couldn't eat anymore. So I think it's not just about chefs cooking or putting food out there. The framework also has to be that there are more decentralized growing spaces for communities. So if you, even if you live in an urban environment, you can still kind of own a certain element of what you grow. So there's no food shortage. There's no food scarcity, which is a big problem in major cities because of income inequality. So you're saying then diversify the sources and the, the production lines yeah. um, so that everybody has a say in what and how they consume uh, what's available to them. Everyone's, I mean, I think equitable food systems are the most important in, in cities because of the big widening gap of inequality. So how does everyone have access to nutritious food, food sovereign foods, which are affordable, but also to change the, see, I think even, so even though Malaysia grows 27% more, has more, 27% more agricultural land than Singapore, right? The value of the ingredients that are grown in Asian ingredients are still much less than Western ingredients. Yeah. We still put a huge premium on imported ingredients from Japan or Europe. The only thing I think we really give value to is durian, which we will pay more for, uh, which kind of gives credit to the hundreds of years of choosing the best cultivars, which is why the tomatoes in Europe are good, which is why you get really amazing vegetables from Japan. It's not just luck. It's decades. Engineer. Yeah, it's decades of choosing the best yeah. cultivar and then growing the best produce. And an importance on using local produce. They're so proud of their cuisine. Yeah. We don't have that yet. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I know you've weighed in on this already, but I'm just going to verbalize it. What can we do to preserve all these culture food ingredients with the high demand of non-native cuisine or ingredients from consumers? I know you've weighed in on it, but is there something else you'd like to add to it? I think changing your perspective is like a mindset shift, right? Like looking out is important, but where do you look, right? So can we be inspired by kind of East African cuisine, you know, Zanzibar, which actually has so much in common with Malaysia and Singapore in terms of it being like a little island outpost, influenced by so much trade and culture, Arab influence, Indian influence, Chinese influence, African influence, but so much similarity. They have coconuts, they have durians in Zanzibar, you know. Um, so I think kind of where we look for inspiration, where we place value, um, and kind of changing the lens in terms of what we aspire to eat for the next 30 years. Super. We're going to end with this last question, which I thought was quite interesting. Will indigenous ingredients be able to sustain our nutrition in today's pace? I believe so, yeah, 100%.
Like, I mean, look at all these like superfoods, right? They all come from the tropics. Your turmeric, your coconut, your, uh, you know, your moringa, all the stuff that they encourage you to put into your smoothies for you to get your nutritional needs. That's what my grandmother used to cook with. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if you have a dal with moringa leaves, that is superfood. Coconut, turmeric. Right, and, and it's I, I, I think one of the things that would be interesting is to look at ingredients for the sake of them being ingredients. Because we don't have traditional families anymore. Yeah. You know, like, your, it makes sense for my grandmother to cook like a super intricate rempa because she's feeding a family of 15, yeah. right? She's got eight kids, uh, grandkids. If you're feeding for two, yeah. it's like, okay, it's, it's romantic, but it's not realistic. No, yeah, you that's know? true. Um, so I think it's about kind of using the ingredients that are around you, but putting a global lens on it. You yeah. don't have to be so restricted. It's the world's open, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nithya. I hope you enjoyed that. It was thoroughly engaging. Thank you so much.